we continue to make our way through Matthew's gospel, we turn our attention to the 22nd chapter. We'll pick up there at verse 15, where we left off, at Matthew 22. This is page 827 in your pew Bible, if that's uh, helpful for you. These days, taxes, uh, taxes are on our minds. Just yesterday, Debbie gently reminded me that I must set apart some time to get ours filed. My heart bristled, not at Debbie, uh, at taxes. Nobody likes taxes. The Jews in Jesus' day particularly despised taxes. Taxation to them, you see, represented a double insult. Not only did the government have its hand in their pockets, but to make matters worse, to add insult to injury, it was the Roman government pulling Roman money out of their purses. The so-called poll tax, which is widely believed to have been at the center of this conversation that we're about to read, the annual requirement that each and every person pay a single denarius, about a day's wages for the typical laborer, just for the privilege of breathing the air, was just one more bitter reminder of Rome's yoke on their necks. To have been taken over by Rome was galling enough, of course, in itself, but paying taxes to this pagan empire was salt in the wound for these Jewish patriots. More than 20 years before, when this tax was first imposed, there had been a revolt, as a matter of fact, led by Judas the Galilean. He accused his countrymen of being cowards for paying the tribute to Rome. Well, you know what happens to such people as that. It was that rebellion was quickly stamped out by Rome, but not forgotten. So this potentially explosive conversation that the Pharisees the Pharisee and spies, that is, take up with Jesus, uh, is uh, putting them right on the edge, in a sense, isn't it, of danger. It's the first of three conversations in a row that we will encounter in this chapter, the Lord willing, the first today with the Pharisees, and uh, then later with the Sadducees, and followed by the scribes, the experts in the law. Let's pray. Father, we Pray that as we come to another of the conversations recorded for us in this history that has been preserved for us, no ordinary uh, history in a sense because your Holy Spirit inspired the writing of these words and now he illumines our hearts, we pray for exactly that, that the Spirit will grant us insight, wisdom, understanding, that our hearts may be molded and shaped more and more into Christ's image so that our lives and our actions may certainly follow. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 22, picking up at verse 15. Then the Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle him in his words. And they sent their disciples to him, that's of course to Jesus, along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the way of God truthfully. And you do not care about anyone's opinion, for you're not swayed by appearances. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And Jesus said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. Then he said to them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. When they heard it, they marveled, and they left him and went away. 
My, how these Jewish clerics and elders and their toadies tried and tried hard to trap Jesus with their trick questions, didn't they? And my, how Jesus turned the tables on them again and again and again, as we've seen. They would have liked simply, of course, to arrest Jesus on the spot. But rightfully, rightfully, they were afraid of the people. Many of them, many of the people hung on Jesus' words, you see, and arresting him might result in a riot. Who knows where and how far such a riot would go, but it was entirely possible, even likely, that in that case Rome would respond to a riot in Jerusalem by intervening and in the process removing these Jewish leaders' privileges altogether. And they couldn't possibly risk that. But neither could they tolerate Jesus' authority with the people, and particularly, especially the diminishment of their own as Jesus grew. They couldn't arrest Jesus because it was too risky. Ah, but there was someone who could. Rome. So, these religious leaders descend to the level of espionage. They send spies in the hopes of tricking Jesus into committing a crime against Rome so that the Gentiles can do their dirty work for them. I say spies because that, while Matthew tells us it was their disciples that the Pharisees sent, Luke calls them spies who pretended to be sincere. And we also have here in the mix the Herodians. The Herodians uh, consist of a, or make up a Jewish sect, uh, sincerely friendly to King Herod the Great and to his dynasty. Uh, we've studied that dynasty before here in this house, in fact, just recently. The ironic thing about their schmoozing, about their attempt at flattery so as to throw Jesus off his guard, so, uh, th is that they couldn't have been more accurate. They couldn't have spoken more truly in their description of the divine rabbi. Teacher, we know that you are true and teach the word of God truthfully and do, uh, do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances. Well, they were exactly right. And they're about to be astounded by just how right they are. Tell us then, they go on, what do you think? Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now you can see what they're after, can't you? They're trying to impale Jesus on one horn or the other of a dilemma. They're setting him up. If he says, yes, pay your taxes to Caesar, he will, they expect, lose his popularity with the crowds and maybe even suffer their wrath. On the other hand, if he says no, don't pay the taxes. Now he's guilty of subverting the state and Rome steps in. Turns out that, that this is exactly the accusation, by the way, that they will make against Jesus. One of the accusations, anyway, that they alleged to Pilate, remember, that Jesus had told them not to pay tribute to Rome. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. It's quite the opposite. Jesus responds brilliantly, as always, to their craftiness and silences them in the process. Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. It was not just a clever rejoinder. In just two simple clauses, Jesus has, has summed up succinctly and universally the Christian's entire relationship to the state at all times and in all places. What has always been true for Christians is that we live with our feet in two kingdoms, the earthly kingdom and the heavenly one. As people in whom the Holy Spirit lives as he does in us, we have dual citizenship. We do. We're all citizens, all of us here in this room right now, everyone in the hearing of my voice is a citizen of one earthly nation or another. 
most of us, I dare say, of the United States of America. But we are also, and even more, citizens of the kingdom of God. There was a day in our nation when it was easy for Christians to forget that, to forget our dual citizenship. To be an American at one time seemed almost synonymous with being a citizen of heaven. So friendly was our civil authority, our government, to biblical truth. America had even at one time been described as a Christian nation. Today it's becoming entirely clear that it's simply not so. The storm clouds are gathering for us, for the church in our land whose leadership is becoming increasingly antagonistic to the Christian faith, not to put too fine a point on it, to Christians. In fact, the state is becoming more and more a sinister force, even an outright enemy of our faith. Our civil leaders now not only tolerate but outright promote ungodliness, such as gambling and abortion and all manners of indecency, putting Christians in an increasingly difficult spot. Some Christians have even begun to ask the question, is it right? Is it moral? Is it obedient to God to pay my taxes, to pay taxes? In fact, I, in no small coincidence, I had a Christian just ask me this a couple days ago. Jesus answers those questions, all of them, with a resounding yes. Yes, it is right. It is moral. It is obedient to God to pay your taxes. In fact, it's required of you to pay your taxes, all of them. Even to a government such as ours that is rapidly becoming more and more antithetical, even hostile to the Christian faith and ethic. We must continue to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, period. Actually, Jesus says two things, doesn't he? We are to render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God what is God's. Let's consider those carefully together and briefly. First, Christian, you must render to Caesar what is Caesar's. When the Pharisees' disciples in the crowd, these spies come and ask Jesus about the propriety of paying taxes, tribute to Caesar. Jesus asked for a coin. He asked for a, a denarius. Apparently, Jesus doesn't even have one himself, so he has to ask the crowd. You might say that Jesus coined the phrase, show me the money. But anyway, the denarius is provided, and Jesus points to the likeness of, uh, on the coin, and it is, of course, Caesar's. And and this was one way in which a conquering nation exercises its authority over the conquered, over the, the, uh, the servant-defeated uh, nation by making its currency the currency of the conquered. Imagine walking into Walmart down here, walking to the cashier's station at Walmart and opening your wallet and pulling out yen or rubles to pay for your groceries and you get you start to get some idea of what the Jews are experiencing having to carry Roman money primarily the Roman denarius was in those days a silver coin it bore on one side the bust of Tiberius and an inscription in abbreviated form Tiberius Caesar Augustus son of the divine Augustus and on the other side, an image of Tiberius' mother, Livia, and the inscription, Pontifex Maximus, High Priest. So the coins are an affront to the religious sensibilities of the Jews for two reasons. They bore a graven image and ascribed to that image divine status. Even the very currency of Rome itself was the very embodiment of Roman idolatry, you see. And... The very sight of a Roman denarius was the reminder of the objectionable uh, things the taxes paid by the Jews to Rome were funding. Yet Jesus says in no uncertain terms, perfectly clearly, pay the Roman tax. 
Now, Rome was the occupying power. It was the state. And to the state, taxes must be paid. Jesus paid his taxes, and he tells us to do the same. Right now, our coins happen to bear the inscription, In God We Trust. But even if they were instead inscribed with atheistic slogans or pagan ones, even if our government persecuted Christians for the faith, even if our tax money was being used to erect temples to false religions and idols, and we know some of our tax money is already used to fund the largest abortion provider in our nation, we still have to pay our taxes. Because, because we are followers of Jesus Christ, who said, render unto Caesar. Now look, part of the taxes that Jesus paid uh, were used to fund the construction of pagan temples around the empire. They were used to pay, and here's, here's something to think about. A portion of the taxes that Jesus paid went into the paychecks of the Roman soldiers who nailed him to the cross, who beat him, flogged him, and killed him, were paid by Jesus' own taxes. I think about the Apostle Paul who taught the same thing. Romans 13, he commanded that taxes be paid to the civil authority because as he puts it, they are ministers of God. This is the very same government that had already imprisoned Paul, had more than once put uh, for his work as an apostle of Jesus Christ, had, had persecuted him. Paul goes on to say that we're not only to render taxes, but we are to render respect. Let that sink in. Respect and, if that weren't enough, honor to our civil authorities. And here's the reason. God himself has put them in place. Peter agrees. Fear God, honor the emperor. Honor the emperor? Honor? The emperor, Peter? Who was the emperor at the time Peter wrote? It, Nero! Nero who dragged Christians to their death behind his chariot. Nero, who burned Christians as living torches in his garden. Honor him, the scripture says. What an extraordinary obedience Christians are to render our civil authority under the commandment, render unto Caesar. We have the opportunity, my brothers and sisters, to put this piece of obedience in our, at work in our own <clears throat> lives today. God puts leaders into office. God is the one who has given us the leaders that we have in Washington. God is the one who has put our leaders into office in Frankfurt and in Indianapolis. God has put them there. They are, to use Paul's expressions, expression, God's ministers. God puts kings and rulers in their places of authority and power. Christians of all people, we recognize this because we look on those offices through the lenses of the Bible, of Scripture. So Christians of all people must be the first ones in line to pay their taxes, all their taxes, and the last ones to be found cursing their civil leaders or mocking the authorities. And I will not repeat for you the things that I've heard our president called by Christians in just the last few days. It must stop. My brothers and sisters, our civil leaders must be honored 
respected, obeyed, and of all people by you the most and the most faithfully. God's ministers. That's what the Bible calls them. Second, Christians, you must render unto God what is God's. Now, our temptation at this point might be to look like a, at our money as sort of a pie, right? Okay, Caesar gets this slice in the form of our taxes, and, and God gets this part in the form of the tithe. And in a sense, that's true. Uh, just as refusing uh, to pay taxes to the government is a sin for us, so withholding your tithe is disobedience to God. God calls it, in fact, robbery when we do not bring the whole tithe into his storehouse. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to be found robbing God. That is a bad place to be. But Jesus said, render under God what is God's. And he was saying much more than, than, than a slice of pie. So much more. Step back with me now and ask this simple question. What is God's? What belongs to God? What is God's? What, what portion of your money? What parts of your body? What hours of your day? What thoughts of your mind? What resources at your disposal belong to God? Well, I hope you're saying... All of it, yes. All of it. Every bit of it. Every cent belongs to him. Every square inch of your body belongs carefully knitted together by him as he did, God did in your mother's womb. Every square inch of your body belongs to him. Every thought of your heart known completely by him belongs to him. All your affections all your loyalties, all your obedience, all your loves. So how do we render to God what is God's? Well, it's quite simple, actually, by giving it all to Him, by handling and stewarding it all in ways that are obedient to Him. So look at how the first part of Jesus' words really swallow up the second. Even paying your taxes to Caesar, to your government, is rendering to God what is God's, isn't it? We pay our taxes because we're obedient to Jesus. That's why we pay our taxes. To send your rightful tax payment to the Internal Revenue Service at the right time every year, or as some of us have to do four times a year is to render to God what is God's because your government is established as God's minister to you. Now this also throws some light on just how far a Christian may go in his loyalty to the state, doesn't it? When Peter wrote, fear God, honor the king, God came first for a reason. One honors the king or gives to Caesar respect and honor and taxes only insofar as one can do so in loyalty to God. And so the disciples, when commanded, for example, to cease and desist from the work Jesus called them to do, would later tell the authorities, we must obey God rather than men. Still, the obligations that we owe to God and those we owe to the state are, not, are never to be set over against one another as if they were incompatible. Both ordinarily, and ordinarily is everything except the really extraordinarily, Ordinarily, we may maintain both at the same time, keeping the obligations we have to God and to the state. But there's something of an irony here, too, isn't there? I already alluded to Peter's honor the emperor. That very emperor whom Christians were to honor, as I said before, he was burning them alive as amusement. 
in his gardens. And it has not been the only time that Christians have found themselves rendering honor and taxes to their very persecutors. You may remember the name of a second century Christian, Justin. He was what we call an apologist for the Christian faith, not because he apologized for it, but rather because he wrote a defense of the Christian faith and of Christianity. Specifically, Justin addressed the uh, accusations often made in his day that Christians were disloyal to the state. They had made bad citizens. But he argued that the very opposite was true, that in fact there were no more obedient, law-abiding, tax-paying, hard-working citizens in all the emperor, uh, empire then Christians. And he was right. Nobody could be counted on to pay their taxes like Christians could. Rome needed more, not fewer Christians. But listen to this. It was not long afterward that Justin himself was dragged into a Roman court accused of being a Christian. His accuser was apparently a rival teacher of philosophy who was jealous of Justin's popularity and success. Six other Christians, apparently disciples of Justin, appeared also with him in the dock. The judge was looking to find them guilty. Trials were often political affairs in those days. The judge commanded the accused to sacrifice to the gods of the state. And of course, they refused. The judge, who was well known as something of a a bully, questioned Justin about his beliefs, but the contempt in the judge's voice made it perfectly clear that it was all just a show. When he could learn no more about the Christian's beliefs, he came right to the point. He asked each man in turn if he were a Christian, and each in turn acknowledged that he was. Some were children of Christian parents, had been raised in the Christian faith from their infancy. Others were converts in their adulthood. Most of, not all of them, had been taught by Justin. They were not all clever, but they were all faithful, and not one wavered. They were threatened with flogging. Let your imagination fly. And with execution. Jeering, the judge asked Justin if he thought he would ascend to heaven. I don't think so, Justin replied. I know. And I'm fully convinced of it. After one last but equally fruitless attempt to get them to offer sacrifice to the Roman gods, the judge condemned them all to death by beheading. And so it was that Justin received the name by which we know him today, Justin Martyr. Justin shared at least this much in common with Jesus. Both loyally paid their taxes to the very government that murdered them. Both paid into a system that funded and promoted and enforced idolatry. Both found themselves on the bad side of the same governments, and both were put to death by those governments in part or in whole for refusing to worship anything or anyone but God. Being required of us, dear flock, in Jesus' terse command to render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. What, what, what is it? Well, Jesus is requiring us to be both loyal citizens and faithful, willing martyrs. That's what Jesus is requiring of you. Faithful citizens of this nation or whatever nation you are a member of, a citizen of, and faithful to the Lord, serving him in this world. He's showing us what it means to be citizens of both kingdoms, the kingdoms of earth and the kingdom of heaven.
faithful in earthly kingdoms precisely because we are faithful to heavens. Faithful to earthly kingdoms as the expression of our faithfulness to the heavenly kingdom. Obedient, obedient to the rulers of earth out of obedience to the ruler of heaven and earth. But if faced with the difficult choice, above all and in all to the latter, to the king of kings. That day may come, brothers and sisters, when it will come down to that. The signs of our times seem to indicate that it will come sooner rather than later. When at the end of the trial, the judge threatened Justin, saying, Unless you obey my commands, you will suffer tortures without mercy. Justin replied, We desire nothing more than to suffer for our Lord Jesus Christ. For this gives us salvation and joy before his dreadful judgment seat at which all the world must appear. Christians like Justin did, you must pay your taxes and do so honoring your government and you must be ready, should it come down to it, to pay much, much more than your taxes, both for the very same reason, because you love God, you serve God, you wish to please God, and you wish to do all his holy will. So now, over the next month and a half or so, between now and April 18, tax day is the day after Easter this year, the Christian life will probably be for you a very ordinary kind of obedience. Even if you, like I, bristle <laughs> the whole time you're filling out that 1040 and the 740 and the schedule A, B, C, D, X, Y, and Z. You will pay your taxes even though you are being put in many cases, they are being put in many cases to some very silly and, let's just say it, wicked purposes. You will obey the laws of the state, even if they are seemingly senseless ones, because obedience to the state for you is the, as Paul put it in Philippians, how you work out your salvation with fear and trembling. It is the outworking of your devotion to God. But there may come that moment of truth. Let's be ready for it. When the state requires you or me to do what God forbids or forbids you to do what God commands. When that moment comes, you will find that being a Christian is, as a matter of fact, anything but ordinary. Rendering to God what is God's is to give up anything and everything for the sake of Christ your Savior because it is God above all and God in all, from paying your taxes to enduring tortures, from voting in the booth to dying on the gallows. It is God whom you obey. It is God whom you adore. 